Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The word of God for the people of God. Agnes Biachu was born August 26, 1910 in Macedonia. She was the youngest of three children, and her father was a successful businessman. But he died under mysterious circumstances when Agnes was about eight years old. His business partner left town with all the assets, leaving their family in poverty. And yet, her mother continued to leave an example of service and generosity. Even though her family went without a lot of luxuries, a lot of extras, Agnes's mother took care of the people in their neighborhood by bringing them food and helping some of the elderly people take care of their home. And this example taught Agnes that no one is ever too poor to help someone else. Now Agnes's childhood, despite losing her father at an early age, was a happy childhood. She was blessed with her family. They absolutely loved music and every single night they would play music, they would sing, and they would dance on a daily basis. Another thing that they would do each and every day was her mother would take them to church. 90% of their neighbors were Muslim, but 10%, like Agnes and her family, were Roman Catholic, and so they could go to Mass every day. And she loved the church. It was something that transformed her life. And as early as 12 years old, Agnes began sensing that God was calling her to take religious orders. She started having conversations with her parish priest, and that's precisely what she did. At the age of 18, as soon as she turned 18, Agnes got on a train, not knowing that she would never see her family again, and she began her life as a nun. It was at that point that she chose the name Sister Mary Teresa, in admiration for a French Carmelite nun. She took vows, and she was appointed to serve in Darling, India. Now, Mother Teresa, or Sister Teresa at this point, she had grown up in poverty, but she never witnessed poverty like she saw in India. It was culture shock for her. She saw people living on the streets wearing nothing except a loincloth. And it was her job, her responsibility, to care for sick and dying people as well as educate the children. In addition to these responsibilities, every week she would ride a train to Kolkata where she had formed relationships with people who were living in the slums. And she referred to her friends there as wonderful people. Her life was blessed as she rode to Kolkata each week. And in 1946, after she had taken her final vows as a nun and became Mother Teresa, she was riding on the train, and one day she heard Jesus speaking to her. She heard him say, I thirst. She knew these were the words that Jesus spoke whenever he was on the cross, and as she looked at the slums of Kolkata out her window, she realized that Jesus was speaking through the brokenness of the people there. That the people in Kolkata thirst. They were suffering. And that Christ was calling her to come there and serve the people there on a more permanent basis. And so she began petitioning her priest and her archbishop. And it took two years for them to finally approve for her to move to Kolkata. When she got there, she essentially did the exact same things that she had done in Darling. She cared for the sick, she cared for the dying, and she taught children. The first day that she was there, she gathered children from the village, 
And she taught them the alphabet by drawing the letters in the mud. The next day, more children came out to learn. And while they were there, she bathed them. She taught them the catechism. And she gave out soap as a prize. She truly touched the people's lives there. But one of the things that that really bothered Mother Teresa was the fact that there were people in Kolkata who were lying on the streets, dying alone like an animal. And the description of this is so graphic I won't share, but her heart was just absolutely torn for the people there. And so she wrote to her priest and the archdiocese was able to buy a home for Mother Teresa to live in. It was large enough for her to have her own room, but she used the extra bedrooms to bring people who were sick and dying. She cared with them, cared for them until their last breath. Now, during her training as a missionary, Mother Teresa learned how to speak multiple languages, and she also received medical training. So she knew how to take care of a person medically more than the average person. One of the ways that she cared for people was she would travel around to local pharmacies. She would go up to the pharmacist and say, would you like to do something beautiful for God today? And of course they would say yes. And she would take a a wadded piece of paper out of her pocket and it was a list of all the medications that she needed. And this was the way that she got medicine to care for people who were living in her home. This is the essence of Mother Teresa's life. When I was a kid, I guess all of my life growing up, I've heard about Mother Teresa and all the things that she did and all the wonderful things that she, she accomplished. And I guess I was a little bit surprised when I learned that she spent the majority of her life sitting with dying people, caring, with people, caring for people in the last moments of their lives. And Mother Teresa actually received a lot of criticism for that because there were people around the world who looked to her and they saw the the mass amount of influence that she had. And they asked her why she didn't do more for healthcare reform, why she didn't try to, to change the minds of governments. And her response was, God has called me to do simple things with great love. She believed that government agencies did admirable things, but she said, Christian love is about the person. For me, this was incredibly humbling because we often measure success by productivity and what we accomplish. And the world can criticize Mother Teresa as much as they want. But she was a game changer. She changed the world because of her compassion. Now, as we look at our gospel lesson today, it's really just a summary It's a summary of Jesus' itinerant ministry through Galilee. He's been traveling around, healing countless people, and Matthew tells us that Jesus looks upon the crowds with compassion because they're like sheep without a shepherd. And this is really what marks Jesus' life and ministry. As we read through the Gospels, we find that when Jesus travels around everywhere he goes, He stops, he pauses, and he sees a person. I want to challenge you, next time you're reading the Gospels, notice how often it says that he saw someone. And then Jesus is filled with pity or compassion. It's the same word in Greek. And he speaks a word or he reaches out his hand. And there's healing power that goes forth. Looking at this pattern in Jesus' life and ministry, I'm convinced that the beginning of every miracle is compassion. Every miracle starts with compassion. 
Now, we live in the modern Western world, and I know that we live in a world that's skeptical of miracles. For me, I do believe in miracles. I have a really high standard for what a miracle is. I believe that I've witnessed God's providence in my life, but I don't think that I've necessarily witnessed a miracle. I think a miracle is something that is inexplicable, something that happens that we just can't explain. And Mother Teresa, her life, she lived so close to the heart of God. She relied upon God for everything that she did see miracles. There's one story about how the nuns at at the convent were looking at for something to make for dinner and they couldn't find anything. They thought they were just going to go to bed hungry. And then there was a knock at the door. And a woman came with bags of rice and said, there was this inexplicable force that just told me I needed to do this. She told another story about how that they were preparing a space for another nun to come and visit their convent. They were trying to put together a pillow. And Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa said, just take the stuffing out of my pillow and, and, and make a, a new pillow for her. And the nuns, the, the sisters were saying, no, we, you've got to have a pillow. You've got to have a place to rest. And, and of course, it was this back and forth because Mother Teresa was insisting on giving up her pillow. And as they were standing there having that conversation, someone knocked on the door. It was a British man who had been in the area visiting. He was getting ready to go home and he had a pillow. And he wasn't really sure why, but he knew that he was just supposed to bring it to them there. On another occasion, Mother Teresa and and the sisters were planning on feeding 7,000 people in two days, and they had no resources to do it. And for some unexplainable reason, the public school in India closed for two days, providing enough bread that they would have fed the children for 7,000 people. These are just a few examples of the miracles that Mother Teresa witnessed in her life over and over and over again. I'm convinced that it was because she was relying upon God so much and trusting on God for everything that God's love and compassion was just overflowing from her life and pouring out into the lives of other people. And that love brought healing and power and transformation. And it made me wonder if maybe we don't see very many miracles among us because we don't really want to inconvenience our lives too much. That we just kind of want to snap our fingers And for God just to grant our wish. But God looks upon the humble and the broken and the servant. Jesus' life brought transformation to the world through his compassion, through his healing, and his power. Mother Teresa's life brought healing through the miracles, through her compassion, And brothers and sisters, the world that we live in needs miracles. The state that we live in, in our community, we are surrounded by poverty and homelessness and addiction. And if our lives aren't marked by compassion, it's really easy just to blame and to judge and turn people away. But when our lives are transformed by compassion, then we don't necessarily have to feel the obligation to fix everyone's problems, but we can at least see the people and be present in their lives to dignify them and let them know that they are of sacred worth, created in the image of God. I think sometimes the problem is really that We talk about acts of kindness or acts of compassion. But compassion isn't about acts. It's about an attitude. When we look at the story of Mother Teresa and the life of Jesus, 
they didn't have some kind of a list and say, okay, I've done my good deed for the day. Instead, compassion was such a major value that it determined all the decisions that they made every single day to the point that they saw the world through a different set of lenses. They were looking constantly of how they could bless and serve other people. What would that look like for us as the people of God? To pray to be people of compassion. For our hearts to break for the things that break God's heart. To see the world through God's eyes. If we began living that way, we could be game changers. We could change the world around us. Compassion is about... Compassion is about an attitude, but it's also about our values. And this week I had to spend some time, I felt forced to, to look and reflect on my own values. I had to ask... What are the greatest values? What determines the decisions that I make in my own life? Is it comfort? Is it security? Is it self-preservation? Or am I allowing all the decisions that I make to take other people into consideration? How I might love and care for other people? One of the stories that I read this week about Mother Teresa was about how that she just, everything that she did, she she saw it through the lens of compassion. Everything was motivated by how she might be able to bless others. She, She just hated spending money on anything that wasn't charitable. And so even as she became well known throughout the world and she was flying all over the place, she would call airlines and ask if there was any way that they would let her work as a flight attendant so that she didn't have to pay for a ticket. Because she was looking at ways to use those resources to bless another person's life. If we just took a few minutes today to think of all the luxuries that we take for granted and consider what it would look like for all of us to come together as transformed, compassionate people, the world around us would never be the same. It's a choice, it's about values. It's where we place our priorities and our commitment. It's how we choose to spend our time and our resources and our energy. Most weeks as I'm preparing a sermon, I'm thinking about what can the congregation take away? What can they do? But I don't think that today is about what are we going to do? Because as Mother Teresa teaches us, it's not about doing great things. It's about doing small things with great love. I don't think that today's a Sunday where we think about what we go and do. It's a Sunday where we consider who we're going to be. Are we going to be people radically marked by compassion? Now, I'm not someone who often does altar calls. But if there's a day to do it, I think it's today. I want to invite you to come during our closing prayer, that we might join together as a church in solidarity and say that the values of this congregation are to see the people that are invisible to everyone else, to be people of compassion. Let's just come together and pray and ask God's Holy Spirit to be poured upon us that we might together be a game-changing kind of church. And in those moments, We'll just ask God's Holy Spirit to transform our hearts, our lives, and our communities. Let us stand as we sing.